th that doesn't mean that you are the most faithful when you are lobbying the most grenades indiscriminately in every direction. That's right. yeah. And when you are doing clickbaity stuff on, you know, it's it's yeah. one thing to to LARP faithfulness and courage on social media. It's another thing to do it in real life. And um, and, I, and I, you've got a lot of live action role playing going on in the social media world from guys acting like they're tough mm -hmm. that put them in a room and you'd have them in a fetal position in yeah. three seconds. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, and that's, it's not good for that voice to influence our, our young folks. We are going to have to cultivate backbone, but we're also going to have to cultivate uh, a love for the world that hates us. I hey, y'all. Welcome to Cross Politic <laughs> and Apologia. Woo. This is Apologia Cross Politic mashup. Pastor Toby, Waterboy, No Knox, and of course we have Jeff and Luke the Bear. On the other end is it, is it it's it's the ninja and Luke the Bear. I, I messed that up. Yeah, I, I that, up. that works. Is, is that good I, enough? I don't know. It's good enough. Is Jeff back, Luke? The, the ninja is so sneaky. He's not even here. He's hiding. <laughs> Jeff's not he's, he's, <laughs> he's hiding in the rafters. We started. We down. started without Jeff. He'll he'll, he'll land in a second. Yeah. Um, <laughs> tired of someone else telling you where to go when you have to, medical needs? Are you ready to take control of your health care? Yeah. Then it's time to take a look at Samaritan mm. Ministries. It's biblical, affordable health care sharing with no restrictive networks. Here's how it works. When a medical need arises, you choose the health care provider that's right for you and have a say in the treatment you receive. Send your medical bills to Samaritan Ministries, and they'll notify fellow members to pray for you and then send money directly to you to help you pay those bills. Join 80,000 Christian households across the nation who have already taken in control of their health care, go to SamaritanMinistries.org slash CrossPolitik. But wait, there's more. Speaking of health care. You're just going to read it all out front. There's you know, three, speaking of health care, I love this. There's three things you should know about 1689 cigars. I love following up our health care spot yeah, with cigar cigars, commercials. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. When you purchase from 1689cigars.com, you help, you help provide jobs for folks in Nicaragua who would otherwise have very difficult time providing for their families. It's for the kids. And be reduced to handouts. It's for the kids. Every time you enjoy products from 1689cigars.com, you support reformed church planters in Nicaragua. 1689cigars.com is owned and operated by bivocational pastors here in the U.S. who resonate with Pastor Charles Spurgeon when he said, I intend to smoke a good cigar to the glory of God before I go to bed tonight. 1689cigars.com is honored to partner with Reformed Cigars by selling it's all of number. the blends and sizes available <laughs> from Reformed Cigars. Whether your palate prefers a full-bodied Maduro, a mild Connecticut, or somewhere in between, 1689cigars.com has a blend for you. While shopping at 1689cigars.com, check out their great t-shirts, stickers, glasses, and more. And be sure to check back regularly as they're adding new products all the time. And never forget, 1643 happened before 1689. What's happened? It did. 1643. 1689 is better. That's no, all. That was 1647. 1640. Ah! Yeah, yeah, you didn't even get it right, it. man. You I are the water boy. I set it up boys. so right. good, and then I, I did that. Okay. Grateful to try have... To, to, try to throw a punch and miss. Oh, look. <laughs> Swing and a miss. <laughs> Jeff the Ninja is back. And Luke the Bear, thanks for joining us, guys. What's up, fella? What up? It's always good to have you. Um, So, um, we, um, I mean... Lick, Lick Duncan. I mean, we already talked about this. You guys talked about this. No, Joe uh, Boots talked about um, it. A uh, bunch of people hit it. Um, you know, he, he kicks off with this, um, you know, LARPing business. Mosca mood LARPing. Um, we were LARPing when I got arrested. You know, we were we were LARPing you were, when you we, we build church community here. We're LARPing when we set up a college. We're yeah. LARPing when we set up a classical Christian education yeah. institution. Yeah, Doug, is, Doug that, is LARPing, debating yeah. the greatest atheist of our yeah, time, Christopher, Christopher Hitchens. Hitchens. Right. He's, yeah. he's LARPing at yeah. the uh, University of Idaho, That's engaging right. with transgenders That's and LGBTs. Right. And so, Gabe, you, you tweeted out this yeah. last week, kind of following that show. And, mm -hmm. um, um, you said, here's the deal. I believe there's far more corruption in the church than what meets the eye. Mm -hmm. On the surface, you have KDY, um, uh, Kevin DeYoung, uh, Lig Duncan, or Ligon Duncan, as, as A.D. That's, Robles calls that's him. That's right, Ligon. Uh, Russell Moore and organizations like Crew and TGC. But under mm -hmm. all that, it gets worse. Some of this I know by firsthand oh, experience with oh. the churches I attended in Texas, oh. New Mexico, and Oregon. Some comes from frequent phone calls I get. Some of this is just a feeling of intuition. The reason why America has so much mm -hmm. corruption... It's because the church refuses to deal with its own corruption. The good thing, though, is, is that the sheep are waking up. Mm -hmm. Now, Gabe, I mean, corruption? I mean, yeah. So, so uh, the people, some people did take offense to equating Lig, KDY and Lig um, with corruption. Right. Um, I don't think anybody took offense about more or, <laughs> or <laughs> TGC or crew. But 
what my point was is, I mean, I honestly think Katie Wise is you know, a faithful husband to his wife. I don't. I, yeah. It's not. It's not a shot there. Yeah. It's a shot at what their leadership is doing to the church. So we, um, I honestly think Lig is acting a coward. I think um, mm-hmm. Kevin DeYoung, uh, both their church and seminaries, they followed all the government protocols during um, uh, uh, COVID in 2020, and they have. Um, uh, blog posts and emails and letters out to their churches and Facebook posts out to their churches saying, yeah, we're shutting down and all this stuff. Lig, I should, oh man, not, uh, Neil, I didn't give you this. Lig has a, uh, a photo of him, or he said, I got vaxxed, and he shows his vax card Ooh. and everything. Mm. And then in the comment sections, this is like in like whenever the vax came out or whatever, and yeah. the comment section is like, oh, I thought only those 65 and older could get access to the vax in Mississippi right now. Yeah. And he, in the comment, replied and said, yeah, but pastors have special exemption to be able to get in front of the line. <laughs> and I'm like, Ew. Ew. I'm like, you have, all right, if COVID's a big threat, you're getting vaxxed, and there's all these weak and vulnerable in your church, and you're hopping in the front of your line because of your special privileges? Huh. What kind of leader is that? Hmm. So I, I, I'm pointing at like the surface of their leadership and what they're doing really is seeping down into bigger and bigger corruption in the church. Hmm. If you're a coward here and it's not, you know, it's like, um, I mean, how many pastors just buckled under government, um, you know, and, and obeyed all the government and you got JK Rowling in, in a uh, UK this week. Hmm. Um, she basically told the Scotland police she begged them to come after her and arrest her for disobeying the transgender laws of uh, you aren't wow. uh, of hate speech. Oh wow! She just did that this week. She's like, "Come and get me! Come and arrest me!" Wow! And and how many pastors won't even do that because the cops might uh-huh. come and arrest them? You know, kind of thing. Right. So there's this this culture of cowardice, and then um, and the inability to engage and see themselves for who they really are. Because you got Lig also talking about how Moscow is sowing disunity. It's like. Okay, Lo- log, uh, lobbing grenades indiscriminately at and, us, and, and, sowing disunity, calling us non-Christians because he got there, uh-huh. and uh-huh. and then saying we're the ones that are sowing discord. Okay, fine. It, uh, let's have that conversation. Let's sit in the room. If you really want to work on unity, yeah. here's where we work on it. Yeah, but he you don't you, you don't work position. on you don't work on <laughs> unity. Yeah, yeah. You don't work on unity because you're all unified. Yeah, but you got Doug is a leader in cultural Christianity here in America, whether you like it or not. Yeah, Lig is Lig is the chancellor of RTS. All right, so let's get the leaders in the room and yeah. let's work on unity. Right. Or, but but yeah, and, and you think of Kevin's article again. I mean, I think I think well of Kevin generally speaking. Um, and at the same time, it's just like it's just not you're, you're really not working on unity when you say. Um, I'm going to write this long article that is going to go absolutely berserk all over the internet mm-hmm. about the Mosca mood mm-hmm. and then, and then say, and this is, I'm not going to talk about it. That's right. We're, we're, I'm not going to, mm. there's no follow-up conversations. Yeah. I will not have any follow-up conversations. Let's not work on unity. Yeah. It's, it's just like, do you want to work on unity or not? Yeah. Um, is, I mean, Luke, Jeff, I mean, is it, I mean, is this, um, is this actually, <laughs> is this, so take people like Ligon, take people like Kevin DeYoung who are, in in many many respects, um, faithful Orthodox Christian men. Yeah. right. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, like right. you know, they go through the they they go through the Westminster Confession. They check all the boxes. The nineteen forty three version, though. <laughs> Nineteen forty three, sixteen forty three. I just said the date. Oh my worked. goodness! That was like a joke off a joke. That uh, was even worse. Uh, if there was, if there was a nineteen forty three version, it would be awful. I'm sure it would be awful. Uh, uh, yeah, it'd but, be woke. Di. But like, but like is, is what Gabe is saying. Like, is this a kind of like is, is this proto corruption? Like, is this yeah. how corruption happens in the church? Is this how corruption has happened in our land, where you have otherwise relatively orthodox guys who have just a you know a at the key points where they, they need to stand or be courageous or address something directly. Um, they're, they're dodging. Um, and, um, I mean, is that what's going on? Uh, well, I I was going to say like prior to Ligon jumping on the SS Wokatania in 2020 or whatever that was, um, I had a lot of respect for him. You know, he's just kind of gone down downhill from there, but Mm -hmm. I think that interview was just honestly embarrassing he said so many things that were just not even close to being true or accurate. And I think it would be insulting 
to him to say that he said those things out of ignorance. And I think it would be insulting to us for him to come out and say that I said that out of ignorance. So the question then is, then why did you say it? Yeah, that's where I keep coming back to. And I don't want to ascribe motives and intentions to him, but it looks awfully fishy. <laughs> like, what are you up to? Why would you say these things? Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important for us as we talk about this to uh, do all the foundational groundwork of saying we respect these men. These men are brothers. They're Orthodox, mm -hmm. faithful Christians. They preach the gospel. Um, there's no question about that. And and I've benefited greatly from Lig's uh, teaching and his ministry over the years and uh, haven't heard so much from Kevin, but I have read some stuff and, and appreciate uh, some of the stuff that I've seen. But when we talk about Lig and Duncan in this interview, it was it was out of it. To my mind, it felt so unbelievably out of character hmm. um, in terms of the man that I thought that he was through his preaching and teaching ministry. And, and, and like I said, I've I've benefited so much from him. Uh, and I'm talking about the Ligon from like 20 years ago, um, listening to, to stuff from him and, and drawing just a lot of great spiritual benefit from uh, the feasts many, time, many times he's given. So all that said, there's the foundation. The next point is this seems so out of character and, and honestly, and I mean this with as much respect to the man as I, as I possibly can muster, it was embarrassing. He made uh, some scriptural mistakes in, in trying to throw a punch at, at, uh, at, mm -hmm. at Moscow or guys like us. Uh, he made some, he, he confused uh, John the Baptist with Jesus at a point. Right. Uh, he got historical uh, information wrong regarding Roe versus Wade and the abolitionist movement. It showed that he's willing to speak on things out of abject ignorance and to get it wrong publicly and to leave a public record of error. And all of us are going to make mistakes. All of us are fallible. All of us are going to do that. But I think one thing we should all fight against is ever leaving a public record of error, of egregious error, which he did mm -hmm. a number of times through that interview. It was, again, so out of character for him. And then when he goes after the issue of theonomy, some of the mistakes he makes there, um, it was, I, I think, again, from from my perspective about Ligon and how I feel about the man and how much respect I have for him, it was embarrassing. It was so out of character. But I think it, it gets us to this main point. And it's the point that is the problem of the pulpit in the West, where many even faithful gospel preaching, theologically sound and rigorous ministers of the gospel – really hold to a dualism and a perspective of the world and the spiritual and the yeah. kingdom of Christ and its impact on the world mm -hmm. that is just fundamentally not biblical. It is not Christian. And there's the disconnect. So you have a movement and let's be honest, and, and I don't mean this in any kind of haughty way or braggadocious way. It's just what God has done. You've got two major platforms. You've got um, you guys, you've got Canon Press, everything Christ Church has, and then, and then Apology at Church church that are, let's let's be honest, when we talk about impacting the world and ideas of post-millennialism and theonomy, those are two major platforms that are doing that. And, and so been this around for a long time. Yeah, yeah, it's been happening for a long yeah. time. And so this message is spreading. People are being impacted by it. And you have faithful uh, pastors that actually hold to a perspective that is is so unbiblical. And Christians over here are going, yeah, but these guys have answers and they're answers from the Bible mm -hmm. and they're consistent. And you have guys like Ligon that that don't really have a consistent standard. Uh, they He wants to deny pluralism, but he's, he's clearly just displaying some kind of attachment to it. And so the problem I think is you have in the West, you can have faithful Trinitarian gospel preaching, evangelical pastors that know the gospel, that respect the word of God, but they have a perspective of the world and the kingdom of Christ and the kingdom of heaven in it uh, that is just is, is far from biblical and, and the wheels are coming off of the system. Uh, people are saying it doesn't work. You don't have an answer. Like you're saying that God's standards of justice don't apply today. There's no abiding relevance to those things today. So it, it leaves it up to what culture and society to determine today what is actually just when God's spoken as to what is actually just. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got this massive historical Christian tradition that goes all the way back in history. Everywhere the gospel goes and cultures are transformed, people come to Christ. The assumption is if from those people that if we're going to build a culture and society and build a government and establish law, 
by what standard? Who's the God over the system? And so you have so many examples. My favorite is the more recent one in history is the Puritan missionaries that go to the islands of Hawaii. Mm. Within 20 years of evangelism, over 90% of the Hawaiian islands are professing faith in Christ. And when they make their uh, sovereign Hawaiian Christian or sovereign Hawaiian constitution, it names the God of the Bible and says that no law of the Hawaiian kingdom will be at variance with the laws of Jehovah (laughs) God. That was in 18. 20 to 1840. That's not very long ago at all, yeah, right. but that that's where Christians, ha- that's where their mind has been in history. You see it in our own nation here in America. You see it, of course, you see it in Scotland, you see it in France, you see it in England. It's it, There's a whole history of it. And, and Ligon is acting like this some, some weird, strange new thing that you have Christians that want to see Christ honored as Lord in every sphere of life, yep. including government, and God's law being the standard that we look to to say, okay, what would God say to this? Mm-hmm. They, they act like that's so foreign, but it's not foreign to anyone who knows church history. We're not saying it's perfect in history or some sort of sure, utopia. Sure. They're always yeah. got it right. But this is not, we're not strange. He, he referred to Theonomus as like zombies <laughs> that came out of the grave. And it's like zombies, the Puritans. Neil, can, can, you, play, zombies? can you play the a clip um, with with him um, talking about Christian liberty. Um, uh, th- this this is this ties right in with what Jeff is talking about. Protestants invented religious freedom, and in America, Baptists and Presbyterians really forged the consensus that came about on religious freedom. And now you've got a group, you know, sort of wanting to call that into question. Let's go back to monarchy. Let's go back to, uh, you know, to, to state-sponsored persecution, et cetera, et cetera. That's the way to be really faithful. And it's it's very childish um, yeah. to me. It also feels. It feels like a a visceral response. America, this thing that we've loved for so long that we felt in control of, we're losing that. We're terrified. And listen, I get it. I don't want drag queen story hour any more than you do. But as good Bible guys, we're the reform guys. We can't just say, let's take America back. That feels carnal. It's almost like theonomy allows us to baptize that instinct. Well, now I'm trying to find theological rationale for this impulse, you know? So I can actually say, no, me fighting to save the country is a biblical thing. (laughs) So, (laughs) I mean, I I just want to start by just where he begins. Like, he's absolutely right. Right. Protestants invented the idea of, of, of liberty, of religious liberty, Christian liberty. Yep. And, yeah. and the Baptists and the Presbyterians in yeah. our country established that. Mm-hmm. And, and, they, but you just like, you like want to pause and you want to say, yeah. And, and what was the theological basis for yeah. establishing that religious liberty? What was the theological basis for building that, that liberty? And who, who exactly is he talking about that wants to um, reinstitute state sponsored persecution and monarchy? Like, I mean, I, I mean, I, I suppose there's, probably a few Christian nationalists out there who are, who think maybe we could have, we could have a King like they do in England or queen or whatever, but like, but like, those are not exactly the same things. Like having, yeah. a, having a monarchy, like David was King, you know, um, is not the same thing as reestablishing a state sponsored persecution. That's right. Um, mm-hmm. the, 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 the roots of, of, of what he's talking about, the Protestant establishment of religious freedom are thoroughly theonomic. They're, mm-hmm, they're, they're, mm-hmm. Like this is not something new and and childish. This is something that got worked out in the Protestant Reformation, and they were building on church fathers like Augustine, and of course going all the way back to the New Testament itself and the Old Testament. Um, but but the reformers had to work this out um, as they um, as they brought the scriptures to bear to everything. This is why the the um, the Reformation is sometimes referred to as the magisterial reformation. It was a reformation of the magistry. It was, it was mm-hmm. a reformation of magistrates, which is, we're talking about political rulers. Many of the, the treatises that Luther and Calvin and others wrote were, if you read the dedication page, they were dedicated to princes and kings um, and and governors. And and that's because they were, they were bringing the word of God to bear in the public square. This is not something that's brand new. It's what built uh, the Christian um, Protestant West. It's what built out um, the, um, the the sort of Protestant consensus um, that had developed um, all the way up until um, about 15 minutes ago. We're, we're now <laughs> like now you're some you're some kind yeah. of wacko. I mean, it's, it's yeah. what you're talking about. What got established uh, in Hawaii was that broad Protestant consensus that there's no freedom apart from Christ. There's no freedom apart from God's word applied to every area of life, including uh, the, the public square. That's right. 
Yeah, and you know, there's a there's a big difference between these Christian Protestants that develop this doctrine of religious freedom and wanting uh, religious freedom. They had a context and, and understanding of what that meant. Uh, and over against what people think that that would uh, actually allow for today, like building satanic altars at the Iowa State House. Right. Uh, and, uh, and so there's there's a framework for it. There's a belief system. There's something, and you're right, it's theonomic through and through. And it's important to note that when you have these Protestants that are developing a historical Christian doctrine based upon scripture um, about how how the world should should look. Um, when they talk about things like separation of church and state, um, you've got the Covenanters and the Huguenots developing a biblical doctrine that would protect against something like sacralism. So, so much of what Lig, Lig is, is saying there, um, of course, we would disagree with um, uh, this blending of the church and the state, just like our, our forebears uh, right. didn't believe in it. But the reason we don't believe in the blending of church and state is because of theonomy <laughs> it's be, right. you know what i'm saying yeah, right. so Thus you know it's, it's funny when, when you yeah. when you when you lob these grenades out and you're like oh they just want this you know state-sponsored persecution and all these different things it's like you, uh, wait hold on now wait a second the covenanters were puritans uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Presbyterians. Mm -hmm. The Covenanters were Presbyterians, like you, Lig. Yeah. And there's a, they had a, a really serious history and story surrounding church and state relations. And they That's developed right. a very solid doctrine from Scripture against it. And it doesn't seem like Lig is even aware of, of that, uh, because the theonomists today understand that. So they understand law, they understand its application in society, they understand some history, some Christian history that led up to this in terms of doctrinal development. And it just doesn't seem like he he has any understanding of what theonomy actually is, uh, what theonomists believe. I mean, state-sponsored persecution. I mean, I, like I said, uh, uh, Bonson has a, has a whole section in his book, Theonomy and Christian Ethics, that he he goes into a whole discussion about, uh, here, here's how God punishes people in scripture, like with, say, leprosy, for trying to breach the line between church and state and uh, not blend those institutions together. And so I, I have a problem with how he's trying to describe theonomy. But when you talk about this state-sponsored persecution, I, I want to know whatever do you mean by that state-sponsored <laughs> right. persecution? What what do you mean by that? Do you are you saying that in reference to like uh, a, a church state uh, sort of beast that persecutes persecutes pres, persecutes Presbyterians in the state and and sort of throws them out? Yeah, who wants that? No one wants that. Uh, right. I think we've learned from those uh, mm -hmm. those lessons in the past. We're not talking about that. Um, what do you mean state sponsored persecution? Do you mean like if we say we want to execute rapists? Uh, that that's somehow bad or state-sponsored persecution, some sort of overbearing Christian government. I want to know what he means by that, mm -hmm. by that, but there's just a lot of lobbing of grenades and it's just a mess. It's or, so messy. Or I wonder, or I wonder it like it almost, I want to ask him like, you know, pastor Duncan, are you, are you talking about what we have right now? <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> state sponsored persecution, yeah. we, we, right. We have, we have the DOJ targeting pro-life leaders. Yeah. 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 Right. And and trying to put them in prison for eleven years, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, for for peacefully singing hymns outside of an abortion clinic. Is mm -hmm. that what you're talking about? I mean, like it, it seems to me that um, one one of the things that we, we've inherited from uh, fr from from Bonson and I think maybe R Rush Dooney uh, before, but but the whole idea of this inescapable concept um, is that there, there's it's not it's not whether but which. So mm -hmm. you're, you're going to have a standard. And, yep. and in some sense, there is going to be certain actions and activities and speech and practices that are going to be suppressed. Mm -hmm. And there are going to be certain speech and activities and beliefs and so on that's going to be celebrated. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, and like, you, it's not whether, but which. Mm -hmm. And right. so in a, in a Christian society, um, um, you actually have the maximum freedom for the maximum number of people, which includes people, lots of people that dis you know I disagree with people that atheists uh, includes uh, atheists. All it, the way. It, yeah. It, yeah. it did mm -hmm. invent religious liberty. Protestantism mm -hmm. invented religious liberty, which included the ability for yeah for some heretics to exist and um and and false religions to exist. Um, and, but at the same time, it's like you you've bought all the liberal um secular talking points to think that we're not currently living in a state that 
um, sponsors persecution. Right. Like we, mm-hmm. we, we occur, and, That's and, right. and That's right. to the whole point about Roe versus Wade and, and, and ending abortion. I mean, uh, at the top of the list of people who've been persecuted by our state um, are unborn human beings right. um, mm-hmm. who have been butchered and, and murdered uh, by the millions in our land um, in order to make room for our state religion, uh, yeah. which is the autonomy of man. Uh, right. and, yeah. and, and I mean, so it's like, um, in, in Christ's economy, there's actually a standard that says, no, that stuff needs to stay over there in the church government. And that stuff over there is, is civil and Christ is Lord over all. Um, mm-hmm. but when, when, when you don't have the word of God, when you don't have some form of theonomy, some form of God's word overall, um, then what you end up with is whoever's the strongest is overall, which ends up being the state. And if the state is overall, then the state is God. And Mm -hmm. that's the world. That's the world we live in right now. Well, and it's important to note too, I'll just say quickly that within a Christian framework, if you have a Christian government that acknowledges the Lordship of Christ and looks to the law of God to say what is just and true and good, you're going to have a uh, a nation, a community that actually thrives in this freedom. Uh, that's what the law the law of God will ultimately do. It's going to bless. It's going to bring light. It's going to give freedom to people. It's going to have love for neighbor. It's going to respect personal property. You're going to have this, this hugely, I'll just use the word here. Don't read too much into it. Libertarian uh, society where liberty is, ex, yeah. uh, you know, is, is extolled and heralded and people expect it and respect it. However, if it's a Christian society that acknowledges the Lordship of Christ and the law word of God, it's also going to be the only thing that provides boundaries around a sinful fallen heart that has liberty because it'll have boundaries to say uh, here you have all this freedom but it's not an unlimited freedom that allows for the victimization of neighbor right. and so you're going to have like definitions and standards that give you liberty but put borders around liberty to say but not to the extent that it actually violates neighbor or victimizes neighbor and so it, the point being is you're not going to have true liberty in a society, whether it's religious liberty or personal freedom and liberty or whatever the case may be, apart from the law word of God, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get it because you can try to have liberty and freedom outside of Christ and it's going to have no borders, no boundaries. And it's going to lead to things like, well, I have the liberty to kill my child in the womb because I have freedom because I have autonomy. And so the law word of God actually prevents a a a line of demarcation there that says well yes you have personal liberty but not when it extends to violating your neighbor and not loving your neighbor and only the law word of god can do that okay. and so um you know all this talk of liberty and freedom and religious freedom um you can thank you can thank the 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 theonomists in history for that <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it seems to me that and we've talked about this that a lot of these guys um, are just trying to distance themselves as far as away they can from anything that smells mm-hmm. like uh, Christian nationalism. Um, you know, we we had, we had many shows on Owen Strand's uh, remarks at G three, which I think you guys covered as well. But like, um, it, it just seems like they're allergic to it. And and from one aspect, I understand why because with the election coming up, anyone that votes for Trump is now an extreme white, you know, Christian nationalist. Yeah. And so like, there's this idea like i don't want anything to do with that so they're they're just lumping the enemy because that smells like it you mm-hmm. know so like we're they're in there they're extremists they're saying all this crazy stuff that we're not saying mm-hmm. and it's just like they're just trying to distance themselves as far as far away as they can so he, the the interviewer in that in that conversation i forgot the guy's name sean or something like that yeah, um, yeah. he 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 says something like in passing he, he says no i don't want drag queen story hour Nobody wants that. Why? Yeah. Um, yeah. Why? And, what standard? Yeah, and it's, it's like, yeah. Well, well, how, so, are you gonna are you gonna restrict their liberty? Like, are you uh, and on what basis? By what what standard? But then he goes on and he says um, he feels like it's sort of this fleshly reaction that Christians are having to you know we're, we're losing our nation and and he says it, and it seems like what this primarily is is is, is trying to like basically have some kind of re, um theological justification for our flesh <laughs> and that doesn't seem right because we shouldn't you know we're we're not trying yeah. to take over the country um i mean <laughs> what 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 do you say to that 
<laughs> I, well, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I did forget. That was one of the main things I wanted to talk about with regard to that clip. But um, that kind of uh, that kind of comment is just to me so so astonishing. And I, I, I I'm not exaggerating. When I, it's astonishing that somebody would go after the idea of Christians in whatever culture, whatever nations uh, nation wanting to actually see that nation come under the rule of Christ and submission to His lordship and to turn to Him in faith and that to be just seen uh, across the board. I want this nation to come to Christ. I want my nation to know Jesus. Right. And you know, these people really want this. They actually think it's going to happen. It's like, on what basis is it fleshly uh, for me to <laughs> appeal to Matthew 28, 18 through 20? Probably. Is it fleshly <laughs> for me to believe Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 through 14? Is it fleshly to actually desire to see that the nation comes under the obedience of Christ in Romans 1, Romans 16? I mean, I thought this stuff was like standard fair yeah. Christianity 101, that that's what we're trying to do, win the nation to Christ. Everyone believes in Jesus. Everyone's under his authority. They love the law of God. They're taught what Jesus has commanded. I, it just seems so odd to me. It's like, how did this become so foreign to us in the West that we're trying to win the nations to Jesus and everyone <laughs> bows and confesses to him as Lord? I thought that's what we were trying to do. I thought that's what every Christian believed. Mm, right. And somehow... We have this strange version of the Christian faith that just wants to have Bible studies in basements and wants to have this sort of private Christian experience and like, you know, yeah, we're, you know, we're supposed to be winning the nations, but like, don't expect it to actually be successful. You know, it's, it's kind of wishful thinking here, guys. We're not really believing the Great Commission as, as something that's going to happen. Uh, so I, I, that's, I do, I find it with as much respect as I can muster towards these guys, I find it astonishing that they speak and the way that they do about the kingdom of Christ and its victory in the world. So, well, it wasn't this clip, but he said in, in a different clip, like there's no possible world where that would work. Yeah, oh, yeah. Right. yeah. And yeah. I was like, what about the world in that China. God created? Yeah, yeah. That one? yeah, he's like, talk to the people in China. Like, yeah. Yeah, this would never work. Yeah. And 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 you you meant, we, we were chiming about this before we started recording, but we mentioned this on our show, but like, yeah, Pastor Wang Yi. He'd be it, dying for theonomy right now. It's is like, yeah. what, what do you mean? Like, why do you think he's in prison? He wishes he was in a theonomic country. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, that's why, and that, that, that's the point we we're talking about. Is is Pastor Wang Yi in China is uh, hopefully alive in a dungeon or cell somewhere in China, and he's in he's there for the very thing Lig said is not how Christian uh, Chinese Christians believe. He's there because when he preached, he preached the authority of Jesus Christ and God's standards over the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese government. Right. They caught wind of it. They they uh, prosecuted him for. It and their official statement, anyone can go read it, was that the reason he is he is being condemned and he's being punished is because he was trying to subvert the authority of the Chinese state. Yeah. They understood that his message is very different than many modern evangelicals today. His message was that Christ is actually Lord of Lords and King of Kings and even Lord over China and the Chinese government. Right. That's why he's in jail right. for the right. very thing that Lig said is, is not a thing Chinese Christians. Christians believe. Isn't it amazing that, um, you know, oh, it's like, it's like the current controversy right now. We don't need to dive into it too much, but this whole co current controversy of people saying Christ is King, uh -huh. uh, anti-Semitic and Christ is King, oh, offensive yeah. and everything else. It's that. like, oh, does that bother you? Western people, does it bother you that Christians are actually speaking biblical ease and they're speaking Bible and they're saying that Christ is King, that he's a ruler over all the Kings of the earth, that he's actually Lord of Lords does that bother you. Isn't it amazing? You get this this reaction from people when they actually come into contact with the real Christian message right. that Christ has all authority in heaven and on earth, that he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. When that message is really being brought into culture and society, you have Christians dying, like in China, yeah. in right. North That's Korea, right. Right. and right. in every right. place that Christians have actually brought the real, true gospel mm. of the kingdom message, every place it goes Christians die mm -hmm. because when people start realizing, oh, wait a second, wait a minute, wait a second, you're not saying this is a private thing. Right. Mm -hmm. You're saying he's Lord over me. Right. And that I won't have. And so it, it just goes to show that when you truly preach the gospel and the authority and lordship of Christ, it has dramatic consequences I, I in culture and society. And people today yeah. waking up going, wait. Hold on, wait, 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 Christ, Christ is Lord. I didn't really know what that, what you meant by that. I thought you meant like personal, he's personally yeah. your, you know, your homeboy or something. Well, this is, you're saying, you're saying he's king over me. Yeah. 
Right. Like he's my boss. Yeah. I'm offended. Yeah. And it's like, well, yeah, Caesar was offended too. Right. The, and, and, and this goes back to what you were saying at the beginning, Gabe, about the COVID stuff. I mean, this is why the COVID thing is, has been such a, a, a gift from God actually mm-hmm. is, is like, okay, because no doubt Kevin DeYoung and Ligon Duncan would say Christ is King. Yeah. Christ is Lord, Lord of Lords, King of Kings, and maybe even be willing to go so far as to say, well, yeah, I mean, he's King of China and King of America. But then like, but we're, but the whole point we're making here is, okay, so what does that mean? Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? How does that Mm -hmm. touch down? How do you acknowledge the Lordship of Christ in America? How do you acknowledge the Lordship of Christ in China? How do you acknowledge the Lordship of Christ in these places? Um, And, and that's where the the COVID record kind of matters because Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. what, what you ended up with was a bunch of people who are again, otherwise Orthodox, um, understand the gospel, understand the confession of faith and so on. But at this particular point where the testing point came, where courage was necessary to say, no, we will not submit to these decrees because you do not, you're not in charge here because mm-hmm. Christ is King because Jesus is Lord. He's, he's our boss. And, and, and it's actually interesting. I mean, it's, it's based on the, I mean, the whole COVID thing, the, the, the reason why churches in particular um, really needed to say, no, um, we will decide whether we're going to hold worship or not. Mm-hmm. We will decide what we do in worship services or not, mm-hmm. um, because the church is a government that's instituted directly by Jesus Christ. Right. And right. It, it stands on an equal footing in this world before that's God right. with the state where it's not, we're not under the state. Right. Um, that's the, right. The state is only in charge of the things that Jesus has given them to be in charge of, which right. are crimes that are as defined by scripture. And so when the, but when they say you're not an essential service, when they say uh, no yep. singing, when they mm-hmm. say no communion, when they say you have to wear a mask in mm-hmm. the sanctuary before the living God, um, they're going into um, they, they're, they're the one breaking um, mm-hmm. uh, the division mm-hmm. that God has established between church and state because mm. Jesus is King. And and so that's, and I think that's, that's where they're the ones not being Protestant. Ex- exactly. Exactly. And, well, and, yeah, that's, that's a, the important point just needs to be said, said that there is a burst. So the resistance to all the COVID tyranny, the solid gospel, biblical resistance to the COVID tyranny from the government was churches flexing flexing the separation between church and state. Right. So that very theonomic principle was being applied there. You don't have jurisdiction over this. Right. So far from being this, uh, you know, some people just want like this blending of church and states. Like it's like <laughs> the very people who are the theonomists and everyone yeah. else who was resisting all this tyranny were, were applying theonomic principles and defying the state and showing separation of church and state, not some, right. some, some like joining together of them. We're saying, no, you got two different institutions, two different spheres here right. on equal ground before God. And on that basis, we resist you as the state separation of church and state was being mm-hmm. employed there. Right. So I, I, let's end here. You know, I think I got to read th- another ad still. Do you got to read another? Ad? Okay. Yeah. Why don't you read another ad? And then all I'm, uh, I got all in with <laughs> you're, this, uh, you're done. this part of the conversation. This no, is... I got, no, I got, some, I actually got a good follow up oh, okay. that we can uh, end on. Right. So yeah. All right. Public houses or pubs are not just places to drink beer, wine, cider, or even something a little stronger. It's also a unique social center, very often the focus of community life in villages, towns, and cities throughout the world. We here at CrossPolitik hope to emulate that for you and yours. That's why you should grab yourself a Fight, Laugh, Feast pub membership. Fight, Laugh, Feast pub membership at fightlaughfeast.com. We need you on this ride with us, so pull up a chair, grab a pint, and join us um, at this conversation center. You can grab the app, of course, on your favorite app store. Search Fight, Laugh, Feast or Pub TV. Cross Politic will get it as well. Uh, download the app, have all the shows, uh, access to all of them. But as a Fight, Laugh, Feast pub member, you also get access to all our backstage content, yep, yep. Um, our all our old conferences, and, of course, discounts uh, to the Fight, Laugh, Feast conference this year in Fort Worth, Texas. Fight, Laugh, Feast Dot com. And I'll just one exhortation there. Sign up on our website, not yeah. in the Apple App Store yeah. or Google App they, Store, because like they just get a cut, the, and we don't want them to get a cut. We don't so want the Amal- go to our go don't, to our website. Don't let the Amalekites take their. Cut. That's right. Um, so, <laughs> um, uh, it, it seems to me whenever something like this happens, where someone lobs a bomb at us, um, you know, which we're happy to answer and answer questions and have conversations. Oh, we'd also, love to have conversations uh, uh, yeah. with Kevin and Ligon, but like. It, you know, like even like the LARPing charge, um, I think actually uh, the only person in this room that's ever been a LARPer is, is Jeff Durbin. Jeff. Jeff. Yeah. yeah. He's a, he a Mortal Kombat LARPer. Yeah. 
<laughs> mm. Is that LARPing though? Right. Uh, I, right. Is that what? What is the definition of LARPing though? Like really? Um, live is, action role play. Yeah. Live La- action role play. That's right. That's all right. right. You yeah, did. I guess. Kind of, yeah. Kind of, I mean, sort of. It was more of a professional kind of, stage Broadway you stage. You were getting paid for it. It wasn't like at the park. I, I think about LARPers as the guys like <laughs> out in the field, wrecked yeah. and like like wizards yeah. and yeah. like yeah. like yeah. fireball, fire, fire, fire. I wasn't involved in that. Mortal Kombat does throw fire at times. You're not that far. You're not helping yourself. <laughs> the truth I guess comes not. out. You're on a stage and not in a field. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah. Ligon was talking about. All Jeff right, Durbin. all right. Let me land this. Let me land this question for you, Jeff. Um, okay. uh, and so it seems to to me when these things happen uh, with these charges and bombs coming our way, it's like they're the ones actually doing what they're charging us with. Mm. So yeah. they're they're the ones sowing discord. Exactly. They're the ones <laughs> larping. They're the ones who um, aren't being accurate about their brother's theology mm. to, um, uh, or their. Or, or or their abolitionists and what they're really doing and and they're the ones um, slandering and you know mocking. They are, uh, Lig didn't mock, but he s- absolutely slandered us. Mm. Um, and he's charging us with all that. Um, I, I mean, I don't know why that happens. What 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 what's the you know us sowing discord and 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 then he he charges us with um, you know like you said at the very beginning of the show like one of the things Lig said was that we'd walk into a room and we'd all fall down in the fetal position in three seconds. Right. In other words, we're cowards and we, <laughs> we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't hold up to right. the, to the challenge. Oh, right. Yeah. And, and, and look, uh, look to just grant him this. I'm sh- I know, look, I, I, I can't stand and I have to work on my own sanctification, uh, armchair evangelists and armchair, armchair debate pro- professionals online, people that have no history of debates and try to, uh, try to, um, critique debates and try to act like they know exactly whatever everyone should have done. It's like, well, you need to have like some street credit before you can like, you know, start telling everyone else sure. how they need to do this. So I have, I do have a, a problem with that. And I'm sure there are guys that talk a lot of smack online and what we ought to be doing and let's storm the gates and everything else. And they just don't do that. They don't have the street credit to say it, but let's be honest. I don't think that's who Ligon was talking about. When you talk about uh, people who are LARPing and if I had them in a room, they'd be in the fetal position and they act all brave and courageous online. It's like, well, do we need to go through like just a short, short summary history. How about the Psalm singing? How how about being arrested for standing in the public square, proclaiming Christ and his glory in the public square, being stopped for doing that? How about debating the world's most famous atheist, like I noted with Christopher Hitchens, going toe to toe with the world's best? How about, you know, standing in the public square and and getting just uh, vilified and and, and college campuses Mm -hmm. and people protesting you and all that. And in terms of our own ministry, Planned Parenthoods. (laughs) Yeah. In terms of our own ministry, Ministry yep. in, in what God, by His grace, has allowed us to do. You know, standing in front of Planned Parenthood, saving mm-hmm. thousands upon thousands of lives outside of the most difficult place, and the gates of hell are like right there. How about standing before legislatures and calling right. them to repent uh, for their allowing children to die in their in their state? How about how about calling them to repent and turn to Jesus for forgiveness and salvation, and warning them about a day of judgment that's coming where they're going to uh, be held accountable for how they respond to a bill that we've presented. Which is actually I mean, I loving think, your neighbor. I, it, which is actually I, yeah, loving I, your neighbor. I, I, I'd like to know who's LARPing because I, you know, I'm sure yeah. Lig's done a lot of great things. I praise God for him. Again, look, we're all a work in progress and all of us have our failures and our blind spots. I get it. But if you're going to make the accusation of LARPing, then show me the street credit. Yeah. Give me the street credit. Now tell yeah. me how you can display, look, over the last 10 years of my life, here's my street credit to show you that I'm, I'm actually brave and I'll put you in the fetal position because the people you're talking about are the ones that seem to be doing the moving and the shaking in the culture around us. Mm-hmm. They're, we're the ones who are in the public eye being uh, persecuted and being attacked. I mean, the New York Times does a full page thing of Apology at Church mm-hmm. and yours truly and uh, going against us and, and talking mm-hmm. about all the kids we have in our church and, uh, <laughs> you know, all this stuff. It's, it's like, you know, I, I think we have... I, my point is this, is I don't know who you're talking about. Are you talking to Mo- about Moscow? Are you talking about Apologia? Because we don't fit what you're talking about. So who is it you're you're going after yeah. here and trying to, to critique and trying to correct? Because the people that you're talking about, I think, are the ones that actually have the street credit uh, to show a, a bold confrontation of the culture under the watchful eye of the Lord Jesus and under his standards, trying to be the best we can as fallible human beings, humble and bold at the same time, 
time and faithful. Um, and so all I would say to somebody who's looking from the outside is like, let's just look at it objectively. Step outside of it and look, look, you know, right above it and say, okay, who's got the street credit here? Mm-hmm. Who looks like who looks like they're being bold? Who's who's the one actually taking steps that could actually come with dramatic consequences? Because, you know. Let's be honest. Uh, you're safe within the walls of a seminary. That's right. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's very, it's very safe. Yeah. It's super safe. You're surrounded by Christians. It's lovely. It's wonderful. I've experienced it. It's great. Yeah. You're not safe uh, at on Mill Avenue downtown. Yeah. You're not safe at at, at the um, uh, Phoenix City Council yeah. uh, it, in terms of being hated and having you know pro choicers standing next to you, sneering at you, and having the mayor just mm-hmm. be scowling at you. Mm-hmm. You know those aren't safe places. So all I want to say is this: is step outside of it, look down, and ask the question: Who is truly larping? Yeah, yeah, and That's I, so good. and I'll just and I'll just close here. Just back to your point about leadership, Gabe. Is I think you you can't. You can't lead if if you're not going into battle. You just yeah. you cannot lead your people into battle. And I and I and this is I, I'm I'm reading through Second Samuel right now, so this is fresh on my mind. But of course, you know David is, spends his whole life going into battle. It's when he stays home from battle that he gets in trouble with Bathsheba. That's right. That's right. Um, but but ordinarily he's going out into battle and he's doing it until the very end of his life when finally he's growing weak and some of his top generals are like, "All right, you're done. You're you, becoming you, a problem you, for you, us you, out you, on the you, field you now." Need to retire, but <laughs> but you you cannot lead and 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 I think um, that's what's happened in COVID. I think it's been exposed that there's been a, a, a leadership a failure at this yeah. particular point. And I think um, to, to, to Kevin and Ligon, I, I think there is, there's a legitimate place um, where um, they could change course. I, I, they, they, can, they can say, you know what? Mm-hmm. I shouldn't just sit in my armchair mm-hmm. and, and, and say this. I, I should engage these brothers. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and maybe the engaging them, in, engaging us is th- them telling us where they think we really have blind spots or we th- they think yeah. we're wrong. Yeah. Engage us um, and, um, and actually bring the truth to bear. That's what shepherds do. Mm-hmm. Um, they lead, they go into battle, they go into battle with the pagans, and they also go into battle like Paul did with Peter, with, mm-hmm. with standing to his face. And, um, and if we're wrong, We'll acknowledge that, and 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 I think this is another place where there's another place where many leaders fail, as they 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 think that they have to save face, they can't admit they're wrong. Right, and this is one of the places where I have the um, despite various differences I have with John MacArthur. Yep. one of one of the reasons I have such great respect for him is because of the about face they did yep. at the beginning mm-hmm. of COVID. Mm-hmm. Um, right. they, they said, we're going to submit. And they did that for, I don't know, three weeks or six weeks or something. And then yep. they and then they announced, never mind. Yep. Um, that's wrong. We, 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 we studied it again and, and we're opening and we don't care. And I will always, always yep. have right. very, very deep respect for that move and yep. his leadership <laughs> in particular. You're theologically explaining why he did yeah. what he did. And, yeah, and, very and good. taking tons of flack from mm-hmm. many people in the broader reform formed evangelical world. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and so, um, but this is a place where you can apply these principles all the way down and you need to don't, don't be a LARPer. Don't, don't, don't you be lobbing grenades and not actually practicing this in your home, in your marriage mm-hmm. with your kids. Um, and if you've been wrong, make it right. That's right. Um, if you, and, and don't, don't be, don't be like this, just issuing fiats yeah. Um, to your family, issuing fiat in your church. Be the be the pastor. Writing blog, blog posts yeah. and not wanting to have any more conversations. Be the elder. Be the deacon. Yeah. Be the father. Be the brother who who is willing to have the conversations. Um, with the truth is the standard. God's word is the standard. Um, all at the at the very core of your life, and then all the way up, and insist that your leaders do the same. And the good thing is, is this is what I said in my tweet is I think a lot of um the church the sheep, sheep are waking, waking up. up. Yeah, they are. We, yeah. you know, you guys can see the same thing. You yep. know how many podcast downloads you're getting, and it's not f- just coming from your church. Yeah. Nope. You know, you know where they're getting downloaded, which states. Yeah. Which we know how many blog post hits we're getting. We know who's sharing our tweets. We know who's reading our stuff in a lot of ways. And a lot of it is Lig Duncan's or, people. Or you, or you, and a lot of it's Katie Wise people. Yeah. Yeah, you can, and or you can just see how full your <laughs> church service is on Sunday morning. And yeah, so exactly. We're, we're yeah. running out of room. And how many people are moving to Moscow? How many people are moving to Arizona? Apology. I mean, yeah. like we can see yeah. that. The I think the reason why Lig and Katie Y are doing what they're doing right now because it is a concerted effort. Uh, Lig Duncan referenced that that Katie Y 
um, even before he dropped the blog post a month or two ago, told him about it and <laughs> yeah, discussed had it. Had run it by him. Had run it by him and yeah. all that stuff. It is a concerted effort. It's because their people are listening to us because they're finding answers in our exactly right. um, in our theology that Lig and Katie Y are deficient in in their own theology. And you know, I, I mean, I would assume they're all mills. Why some of this is being driven from their all mill kind of uh, two kingdom perspective. So, yeah. Hey well, guys, thanks so much for yeah, coming on yeah. the show. Love doing our our annual cross politic apologia mash up with you guys yeah i appreciate you guys very much always love it guys thank you for having us i got a good old 19 and no 1647 (laughs) you still can't get it right (laughs) you know 1689 if you're single get married if you're married have kids if you have kids go baptize them the 1689 was cool with it until next week love god with all your heart soul mind and strength love your neighbors yourself go fight laugh and feast welcome to cross politic and apology and mashup God commands us to let his word dwell in us richly in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We're to worship him musically. We're to proclaim his word musically. And so we want to train up our our students, our children, to be able to sing skillfully with music, to understand what they're doing. Bible says sing with understanding. But it's all couched in studying God's word, growing up as Christian worshipers. Sometimes I know people are a little scared of music camp because maybe they're not a musical family, but it's it's for everybody. It's a mix of real beginners and more advanced students, and they help one another that way. But the thing that really gives it weight and and glory is that the, the whole week is focused towards a concert, a glorious presentation of the music we've been working on all week long. So there's this goal in mind. There's something that the students not just participate in, but actively create. I'll see students who come in who have had no musical experience. You can tell they're overwhelmed by first day. They're just awed by it because they've been part of something that is new to them and much larger than them, something they've not experienced before. And I would say the majority of times, those kinds of students come back because they've tasted something that's really glorious, a foretaste of heaven. These students uh, are learning through the course of their time at music camp not to be music consumers, but to be active participants in making music. So not only to learn how to sing well, how to understand music as it's written on a page and how it comes together in a group environment, but to be able to take those experiences and have them be the seeds that are planted for their involvement their whole life in the musical life of the church. We want these students to be the next wave of worshipers in the church who know how to sing to God.